Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's so good to have you here today. My name is Janelle Tassard. I'm with the Greater Phoenix Chamber, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to our quarterly diversity, equity, and inclusion employer forum. I think we have some folks uh, still trickling in, so we'll welcome them as, as they come online um, and look forward to a great conversation uh, with our guest speakers today, as well as some of our uh, DEI committee members and, and looking forward to hearing from all of you as well. These quarterly forums are designed to gather uh, community members together to discuss strategies and solutions surrounding DEI initiatives in the workplace. Our goal is to help your organization start to take steps toward bringing DEI practices into your company or build off of some of the programming you may already be doing. Uh, we at the Chamber are doing this work right alongside you and our committee of uh, board members and community members who are experts in this area are available as a resource to you as well. In addition to our DEI professional committee, I also want to thank our sponsors of the Chamber's DEI program. So a huge thank you to APS, SRP, the Arizona Diamondbacks, Cox Communications, and ideas collide. Hopefully you've had a chance to utilize the DEI toolkit for business, which can be found on the Chamber's website at phoenixchamber.com slash diversity. And since DEI initiatives are always evolving, we've added some exciting updates to the toolkit and we will continue to refresh it on an ongoing basis to make sure that the information is up to date. We also have a great video library and additional resources online so that you have all of this information at your fingertips. Today's program is intended to be both informative and interactive and to answer your questions and provide guidance on a topic that we hear uh, a lot about people wanting more information on. So we're going to have a presentation by Matt Clyde and Vicki Diaz with Ideas Collide focused on creating and sustaining an authentic company culture. And then we're going to open it up for audience Q&A and dialogue and really encourage you to participate in whatever way that you are comfortable uh, asking questions, sharing what you're doing as well. You can submit them through the chat or Q&A box at any time or uh, in the open forum. But to kick us off, I am pleased to introduce our DEI professional committee chair, Laura Lynn Smith the Division Vice President and General Manager for ADP. So Laura Lynn, welcome and please take it away. All right, great. Thank you so much, uh, Janelle. And we're thrilled to have all of you uh, participating in this session today. So every quarter we do hold informational sessions um, as the DEI Committee for the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. Um, I would love to just recall some of the most recent uh, conversations that we've had. Uh, last quarter, we spoke about fostering equity and empathy across differences. Uh, prior to that this year, we um, had a great conversation about DEI allies, ally to co-conspirator, conspirator, sorry about that, how organizations can drive meaningful change, and then also how microaggressions impact the workplace. So that's just a couple of the recent ones. We have been holding these forums for two years. Um, and I'm pleased to have joined us today, members of our DEI professional committee um, in attendance, Janine Watanabe, Veronica Aguilar, Angela Palmer, and Dora Savron, to name a few. Uh, we're also thrilled, of course, to have one of our long standing members of the DEI committee, Matt Clyde. Uh, presenting today along with Vicki Diaz from Ideas Collide. So thank you so much to both of them. Um, we will continue to host these virtual employer forums quarterly. Um, please also reference our DEI toolkit out on the portal. We have made some recent changes, notably around allyship. Um, and aside from these quarterly sessions, we are dedicated to being resources for you to whenever you have questions. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to the chamber staff who will ensure that we get you connected with a DEI member. Um, now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Matt and Vicki. Uh, welcome and please take it away. 
Thank you, Laura Lynn, and thank you to everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, and to my fellow committee members, uh, we're more than excited to uh, take a lot of the collective things that we talk about a lot in a lot of these prior discussions and, and bring it into a conversation around culture and sustaining an authentic company culture uh, for your organization. And we often uh, share and talk about no matter where you are on the DEI uh, journey and in exploring the best practices and the, the best, most effective approaches um, to building culture and sustaining an authentic culture and, and tying that into DEI. Uh, we, we want this to be a journey. It's a, a learning journey. Uh, it's a journey where everybody can belong and uh, we're happy to share some best practices and some insights um, from our organization and, and also coupling from some really great uh, collaborators that have helped influence this alongside of me, with me uh, is Vicky Diaz. Uh, Vicky Diaz uh, and I will be carrying over uh, some topics from, just go back to that other slide real quick um, about, uh, we'll be covering creating that authentic culture, how to implement your DEI and B program, curating and this really important uh, successful full life cycle for your employee, not just um, at the onboarding stage, but, but continuous. And then we'll open up as mentioned with Q and A. Uh, Vicki helped me and has been a, a key partner of mine in building and uh, creating a lot of our content and as an advisor in our DEIB um, efforts and investments. And uh, Dickie, Nikki, uh, Vicky is a, a senior brand manager uh, for Ideas Collide and a proud uh, mother and uh, does a lot of great uh, content and account work for our organization, um, is very committed to her community as well. And so I'll let you uh, take it away, Vicki, and, and uh, thank you for joining me in this uh, conversation. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'm really excited to, to be here and have this conversation. Like Matt said, um, it's definitely a, a big part of, of our culture at Ideas Collide. And I've been fortunate enough for the last nearly two years to be um, a very uh, huge part of that. And uh, it's been a, quite, Matt said, a journey. Um, so before we dive in, I wanted to take um, a moment to you know, sort of set the stage and share what we hope you'll take away from this discussion um, and give some insight into how you can begin you know, doing the work for your culture needs and you know, finding those solutions and action items that are gonna work best for you and your organization. Um, first, we'll look into creating and sustaining an authentic workplace culture and, and starting with defining what authenticity means. Um, then we'll explore how to build an inclusive workplace culture and how to successfully integrate that um, at DEIB program into, into that with some you know, key building blocks um, to help implement that uh, successfully. And then lastly, we'll provide some you know, direct insight from our own organization um, and provide some best practices and suggestions on how to ensure all that is successfully a part of your employee life cycle. And, and overall, we just want uh, you to take away these learnings and be able to integrate into your workplace um, as needed. So starting with uh, creating a, an authentic workplace culture, um, I think before you dive into a plan of action, it's, it's really important to start at the heart of it, which is defining what authenticity means to you and how that is reflective in the workplace. So um, authenticity in the workplace refers to when your employees feel safe and secure and comfortable in you know, being able to voice their opinions and their thoughts and their feelings and, and overall being able to come to, to work every day, um, showing up as their true and authentic self. And um, in order to achieve that, um, you have to start with yourself. Um, so authenticity in the workplace culture starts with authentic leadership and ownership. It begins with you. Um, I see it like as anything in life, when you are wanting something to occur, when you know there an action needs to take place, or you want something to come back to you, um, at the very essence of, of that work, it is you. And I say whether you're a leader by title, by definition, by spirit, um, there's four points um, that come into building like authentic leadership. And it starts with self-awareness. 
And this refers to awareness of like your shortcomings, your abilities, and the impact they have um, or they may have to situations and individuals. Um, then there's transparency or also known as relational transparency, which is exactly as it sounds like. It's it's just about being truthful and honest and um, you know, communicating opinions and emotions and feelings. Um, uh, you know, authentically, um, and overall, you know, presenting your true self to others, you know, in order to build that trust um, and that cooperation. Um, third is fair mindedness, which also can at times can be seen as balanced processing. Um, and this refers to collecting information um, and insight before you make decisions. So gathering from um, all uh, all stakeholders who are involved and in, you know wanting to ensure that everyone who um, who is involved in this a project a process that they feel that they um, are being heard um, that their thoughts are being considered before you make decisions um, and then there's internalized moral perspective which is the um, ethical um, decision making and, and behavior so being able to integrate your, your values and actions in accordance with your internal um, moral values. So um, I think when you begin to, to evaluate and to assess um, authenticity in the culture, you have to begin that work with yourself. And once you start to be able to create that internal dialogue with yourself, that immediately would begin to spill into the actions that you create, um, the decisions that you make, and overall um, be able to, to have um, not only team members and employees and partners be able to feel that um, and also be able to um, give that back to you. We see this also as you put this forward, and I think this is something that's often uh, discussed is uh, as you, you invest in a, that authentic culture, you invest in that, uh, those key areas that Vicki just outlined uh, there are definitely um, great outcomes uh, and why that matters in the workplace. And we always like to tie it back to this because I know many in our conversations uh, talk about, well, I, I, I'm getting pushed back um, from my organization leadership or I'm, I'm not getting the buy-in. And, and these are the reasons why it matters in the workplace. It really does drive that increase to employee engagement and performance. It shows and encourages both a personal brand can be connected and, and, and finding your purpose and passions and um, what's authentic to you can be part of, we put more into our work life uh, more than anything else. So we need that um, connection and, and how it defines and connects to your personal brand and, and your purpose. Definitely see lower turnover. We know we've uh, witnessed that in our work and in work with other clients in bringing that authenticity into the conversation and into making sure multiple voices are being heard drives innovation. Uh, more voices lead to more innovation and that stronger sense of belonging. And uh, love that this insight of you can always take a mistake um, and, and you definitely make mistakes along the way when you are authentic, it means you're more vulnerable. And so when you're more vulnerable, you can say, hey, this was a mistake and, and how can we build on this and learn from it to turn it into um, something that we can grow from. And uh, these really build that, that sense of purpose uh, in these efforts of building both authentic cultures and, and cultures that have DEI um, at its foundation. Yeah, and, and to start building that foundation, it's, I think it's really important to note that whatever you set for now may not be what you will have in place in two, four, seven years. Um, it, you know, the workplace culture is, is not static. It's, it's constantly evolving as you grow, um, not only as individuals, but as an organization, so does it. And I think it's, um, it helps to, when you are able to to evaluate this on an ongoing consistent basis. This helps ensure that your culture remains authentic um, and as well as supportive of your employees. Um, and then you're able to really analyze, you know, um, what fits and what doesn't, you know, staying, what, what elements are staying true to who you are and, and what you wanna be. And obviously a big portion of that is, you know, creating um, dialogue and space for employees to also contribute and own the culture. Um, so a good way, 
to look at this is um, there's these three pillars that I that I like to use. Um, and it starts with like, as we know, authenticity starts with self awareness. So a lot of um, what takes place at the beginning is asking yourself these questions of, you know, how am I being authentic? How can I incorporate, um, you know, this authenticity into the workplace already? Um, and so I think when you begin to ask yourself these questions, or as a team collectively begin to ask yourself these questions, you're sort of then beginning to put the breadcrumbs into place of, okay, then what, what are the areas that we need to revisit, to um, reevaluate? And um, some of those core ones that I think are incredibly important um, to making sure there's there's that bridge of that authenticity across um, everything you do is to visit these three pieces, which the first and foremost is core values. I think if there are things that you're positioning with inside your organization as like, this is who we are, this is, this is a testament um, to how we um, manage employees or how we manage um, our culture, that should be reflective in the values that you uphold. You know, values are probably the first thing that people see when they come to your website um, or as you explain what your organization is about. There's usually a core set of values that are is that is that roadmap. And so if you're saying that, you know, diversity and equity and inclusion is is part of that, but it's not reflective in the values that you're presenting, that's probably something that you need to revisit, um, as well as attracting and retaining talent. Um, how are you encouraging and empowering authenticity within the hiring process? Or when was the last time you reviewed and modified your um, employee life cycle? Um, and then communication and, and recognition. You know, how are you celebrating the successes and the overall feedback that you get from, from team members and from staff? Um, and then how are you encouraging that open and transparent communication? So by evaluating there's so many other avenues that you could evaluate but i think with these three core ones um that really does give you more of that that stronger foundation of not only living by what what you're what you're saying that you are but also making sure that that bleeds into the culture that you're creating within the employee life cycle but also within the day-to-day -day, which is extremely important and I think once you begin to ask yourself these questions, those breadcrumbs begin to form, you begin to evaluate those, those sort of key areas that you know maybe have some of those, those holes or, or maybe needs to be revamped, that's when you're able to finally establish um, your efforts. And this is just a, a, a brief overview of so, many, of so much of those efforts that could be in place, um, but it's really looking, okay, so when my efforts are established, what do I know I want to hit? I know we want um, a leadership that's able to lead by example. We know that um, we want to create an organization culture of trust. You know, so how are we going to do that? We want to listen, respond to feedback. You know, we want to build diverse teams. So there really is like this step by step um, sort of upbringing pillar of, of starting at the ground for starting with yourself um, and be able to then just sort of tack that on into um, the, the changes that you want to make. And five things I, I definitely want to go over in terms of what to keep in mind when creating um, and nurturing that authenticity is to keep inclusion top of mind. You know, you want to build an environment where everyone feels welcomed and respected and valued, um, regardless of, you know, their background, their experience, or even their position within the company. Um, so how do you do that? Um, you definitely want to encourage open communication. And more importantly, you want to encourage a two-way communication. Um, it's not so much necessarily of like, listen to what we're saying or tell us what you think. But when there's a dialogue, when there's a strong two-way communication of that dialogue, that is where action takes place. Um, and so you want to provide an environment where, you know, employees feel safe and comfortable sharing their ideas and opinions. And one way um, to encourage that is by, you know, giving... Um, an end to decision making. So letting them know their voices matter, um, not only in you know, the, the work that is done, how the organization is run, but also but what aspects go into the culture to support them on a day-to-day -day and long-term basis. Um, and like we shared in a previous slide, um, that needs to be established through th this like lead by example. So even though leaders don't own the inclusive culture, 
they help ensure that it's active and contribute to it. And I think that's it's a huge aspect um, and something that I, I know I personally admire, you know, at Ideas Collide is um, there is, it's this collective effort. It's um, not one person owns it more than the other. There really is this, this partnership that goes into it. Um, and lastly, you know, what's important is, you know, what you wanna be intentional about creating a, a diverse workplace, you know, from recruiting, to you know, training, to employee recognition, like all that intersects with how you build an authentic and inclusive environment. Um, one thing I, I, I wanna mention specifically with this is, you know, if, if your goal is to build a diverse um, and inclusive um, you know, hiring process or a recruiting process, you know, maybe it's not just you know, putting you know, a candidate a search on LinkedIn. You know, th there's, there's so many, um, other ways to go about it in terms of you know building partnerships you know with especially with organizations that are um, supporting you know underserved communities um, underserved populations you know we have a great partnership with you know the Phoenix Indian Center with um, Elevate a a AZ um, and that really gives us the opportunity to uh, expand our our search for candidates that, that not only fit you know the innovation and creativity that we're looking for but also um, looking in areas that we may that may not have accessible access to LinkedIn, you know, who may not have a computer at home to be able to build that LinkedIn profile, um, or know the proper who have proper training or resources to get you know a um, a resume and be able to print it. So I that's one thing I want to um, sort of emphasize. If that is definitely a goal of yours, you know, to really begin to think outside, it's not just the inclusive language that you use, um, but it's also the places um, that you're, you're tapping into to making sure that you are building um, that diverse um, and inclusive uh, experience all around. And this is something I just, um, I just quickly wanna share it. I actually saw this a couple of days ago and in a, in a presentation that I was in and I just loved it. But um, as we talked about, you know, self-awareness, um, we know that that's like the first thing to becoming an authentic leader and, and overall, you know, serving and building this authentic culture. And so I wanted to share this visual of how that's, that really is this ripple effect. You know, when you're building this self-awareness that, you know, broadens into this sense of belonging that then, it, you know, creates this community that eventually serves as, you know, um, everyone um, uh, inclusively being you know diverse you know champions in the end you are going to be able to build this, this equitable and inclusive environment and and that's the kind of way that i see is within the ripple effects are these key objectives that you know that you want um as well as you know within these these text boxes that i have these are seen more as you know guiding points or actions on how to um to obtain that or you know some of these um some items that you can put in place to ensure that you're building awareness you're building that belonging and and really having this this motion of yourself um rippling into all the other aspects of of you as an individual but you as uh, as a part of an organization um so now that we've you know, discuss what authenticity is and, you know, some best practices or steps to achieve that in the workplace. Um, we know that a, a key factor of that is, is creating a safe space. And one of the things that, that one of the ways to do that is through, you know, a DIB committee. And I'm, I'm sure many on this call already have an established, you know, program, but I think even so, um, what we're going to sort of see in the next few slides um, can also serve as, as additional insight or support to make sure those efforts are continued. Um, but for those who, who don't, um, this is a really great starting point to making sure that um, you're, you're thinking sort of through all sort of the, the major areas to be able to form and establish um, and sustain um, a DAB program. So as this statement alludes, you know, uh, DIB, and I, I know for some, it's just used as DEI. Um, uh, at Ideas Clyde, we've been inserting the B in there to really emphasize, you know, that all the work that we're doing does come together in the sense of building a culture of belonging. So we um, recently, uh, since the start of this year, made that change. Um, and I encourage others as you as you evaluate your DIB um, efforts and, and program to, to also consider that. 
Um, but uh, as you know, we contribute to an uh, authentic culture um, by creating a, a workplace where everyone feels, you know, welcomed and respected and valued. Uh, when employees feel like they can be themselves, um, they're able to contribute their unique, unique perspectives. And that ends up, as we shared earlier, creates more of, you know, this creative and innovative, you know, work environment. And I, I quickly wanted to share some, some considerations and best practices as it relates to ways to um, incorporate uh, DIB into your culture and also what to consider when, when doing so. Um, and like we mentioned, it's important to make sure that's reflective in, in your core values. If you're stating um, not only internally, but externally that, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, you know, really uh, having a, a foundation of belonging is important to you. It, it probably should be something that's reflective and not only in your mission statement, but your values that you have um, so to really put emphasize um, not only to partners, to potential candidates, and to even to the employees that you already have established. Um, and also, it's to also uh, it choose benefits that are reflective of the culture that you that you want and that you are trying to create. So, for example, um, if part of like your culture is you you value philanthropy um, and you really are, are encouraging people to volunteer, then it's having a benefit of a couple of hours of volunteer time, weekly, monthly, annually is important. If you're if you're empowering your team members to be um, volunteer and advocates within you know companies and, and programs that matter to them, you need to give them the tools in order to be able to do that. Um, and that can, of course, rain from all types of, of benefits. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be benefits from like healthcare and so forth. But those are very much valuable as well. But it's benefits of like what's going to help them to in their day to day um, as you know an employee at your organization, but also as just um, a contributor to the the community that you serve. Um, and then there's of course practice and accountability and inclusivity. Um, and one thing that I find really important is also to, to gather consistent feedback. I think we, it's just as valuable when we gather feedback after events and, you know, webinars and, you know, trainings, but to have this just ongoing open funnel for your employees to feel at any point, I don't need to wait for this milestone to happen for me to say something and feel heard or feel recognized. You know, I feel very fortunate, you know, at Ideas Collide that, I can just go to, you know, Matt or go to um, uh, our director of people and culture and say, I have an idea, or I'm thinking this, or I'm feeling this, and know that at that moment, I'm being heard and that, you know, action will be taken. And it's not just waiting for, um, well, it's at the end of the year. So let's evaluate what, what everyone's feeling. So we know what to do for next year. There really is this like ongoing, consistent form of, of communication. And then, of course, um, creating and having a DEIB committee in the workplace is is uh, crucial to you know creating that foundation. And some quickly, a lot of this is, is, is I think is some basic insight, but just you know kind of reiterate you know when incorporating um, DEIB into the culture, you want to do so as obviously authentically, but as um, transparent and as inclusive as as possible. You know you. You're not always going to get it right the first time, but I think when you really take the time and the effort to, you know, gather that information of what people are looking for, what they're needing, um, that will help just that involvement naturally occur. Um, and then there is a sense of patience that comes with, you know, forming um, DIB in in the the your culture. Um, not everyone's going to have the same experience, the same exposure. And so I think you need to keep that in mind when, you know, there's specific trainings or there's specific call outs, um, you, you, the, the patience there of, of letting people learn and evolve them, uh, involve themselves um, when they feel comfortable, when they feel like they've given enough of like the education and um, the insight to be able to, to contribute is, is crucial and, and so important. And I think that follows in with the, the third point, which is encouraging that participation and collaboration. Um, always having this open door policy of ensuring that as people feel comfortable um, and feel uh, that, that there's that consistent um, call out and, and opportunities there, it helps. 
And I think one thing that's important to note is um, encouraging this participation and collaboration, but not forcing it. So just like I said, you know, everyone comes in um, with different levels of comfortability, of exposure, of insight. And sometimes that takes time for them to feel like they're able to jump into something um, in order to be able to then be able to play a part in it. Um, and of course, you know, you always want to be prepared to educate, answer questions and, and, and help do the work. I want to add to that, Vicky, if I, if I may, um, you know, as, as the founder and, and uh, ultimate uh, leader of, of the organization, we do have to really live by this idea of you can't just ask for authenticity, you have to make space for it. And I, what I wanted to know is Vicky and I had a, an exchange very early on. I think you had been with our organization maybe 20 days, maybe 30 days in, and you didn't even, you didn't uh, report in to me. You didn't have, you know, there wasn't a, a reason for you just to kind of set up time on my calendar. But at the very beginning in our, in our onboarding, we, we stated like, uh, that open door and that listening, and you took that to heart and, and came in boldly, uh, but with a great amount of self-awareness and you know implementing a lot of those things that you talked about earlier, the self-awareness, um, the passion. And then you also applied a lot from your point of view, um, what a company has to do as well. So this is that partnership that works really well because you, you brought back some of your feedback and your ideas that you were sharing with me and being a, a new member of our team and some observations you were making and you tied them back immediately to the values, both to your values and the company values. You brought it back into um, really thinking of the culture you wanted to continue to influence and, and give input on and uh, brought in ideas and solutions to it as well instead of just kind of throwing it down on the floor and going, well, there it is and, and walking away from it. And so I wanted to use that as a story and an example of how this has to, you know, for those great cultures and for, for programs um, with culture at, at the, the heart of it and, and then bringing uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging um, to the forefront through that, it does take that type of partnership of listening and caring uh, from, from both parties, both from an organization, from a leader, and from your individuals that are, are part of the organization. So it's a great example of how this is being put into practice from, from both of those stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. And this is a very brief, but I think a great, at least starting point and outline for getting that DIB program up and running and also some great tools and insight into how to sustain it. Um, so for those who are just starting from ground zero or maybe are looking to even revamp, um, one of the most important things that I, I, I feel is that comes first is, you know, not only, you know, developing the business case for it, you know, and setting sort of this, you know, creating this presentation of like what you and are envisioning, but it, it really comes with um, senior leadership buy-in. It's, and most importantly, finding at least one advocate on the senior leadership team. I mean, I again, I feel very fortunate that everyone at Ideas Collide executive leadership is already has it buy in who's already that advocate. But really, it is fundamental if you're looking for for creating this from scratch, you're not sure where to start. Find at least that one advocate on the senior leadership team who you know is going to be able to support you. Um, and that's not just from like a support from like okay, let's get this this program up and running, but ongoing. Who's going to be there to help answer questions, help remove hurdles, you know, provide more insight and resources. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely crucial and, and fundamental. Um, one aspect too is conducting an assessment. Um, and I find this to be a necessity when first kicking off um, a DAB uh, committee and initiative. Not only does this help assess, you know, the level uh, your organization, organization is at, like in terms of like how comfortable and, and like it, it, insight people have into DIB in the workplace culture, um, but also what topics interest them? Like what, what do they want to learn more about? How do they wish to attain this information? Um, we have done this last year and um, which is also a point I want to make. Uh, this assessment doesn't need to be done every year. Um, I think especially when you 
the first time around, you have it as um, as deep um, and uh, collaborative as possible. That information that you that you get back can be ut utilized for two to three years. Um, so we did one last year, and uh, our team members were very honest, gave direct gr a great insight into. I love our or organization does this that what we already have going on and on this aspect works. So let's not change it. However, I want to see more, you know, trainings about S, Y, and Z. Um, for example, we have an upcoming training, internal training um, around socioeconomics. And uh, that came directly from the, uh, the assessment that we sent out to our team, because that was one of the topics that came up over and over again. And so of course I'm like, okay, we know there's interest in this. Let's, how do we make this happen? Um, as well as, as you get, you begin to evaluate the ways that they want to learn. That also brings up so many more opportunities. You know, so far we've done lunch and learns. We've done, you know, um, trainings that are, uh, uh, you know, more standardized to even panel discussions to even um, movies and discussions you know, where we watch, you know, a quick documentary during lunch and then spend 15 minutes afterwards as a team talking about what we loved about it, what we learned about it, what new insight did we get from this? So it really begins to open up not only the different ways that you can approach um, these learning opportunities, these engagement opportunities, but also um, the type of, of topics that your team is, is wanting to learn more about. And, and of course, it really is going to set the stage for the goals and objectives that you, you, know, you set out every year. Um, of course, there's the forming of the committee, you know, invite, you want to make it to be an invite for all, keep it open, allow people to come in and out as they please. Um, that's one thing that I really uh, value about what we have established at the agency is it's not once you um, become a board on the committee, it's like you're in it for life because <laughs> we know people's workflow, personal life, it fluctuates and um, we want to be respectful of that. And so we really do have this opportunity where we do have a set committee, people who very much show up and um, contribute on a reoccurring basis. But we like to make sure that opportunity is open for all. So contribute what they like, what they feel comfortable doing and on the terms that um, that make most sense for them, especially because we know life can get crazy and we want to be. Um, not only um, understanding of that, but also be a form of support for that. Um, and then, of course, like we talked about, developing goals and objectives. Overall, the the foundation should be consistent. Like whatever you establish for your um, committee should should remain as is. But the goals are always going to evolve. And I think what we do at the agency, we have goals that we do annually, and that ranges from not only you know how many trainings a year but um, how many new partnerships we want to curate or how many give backs we wanna do or how many attendees we wanna make sure we hit for every um, event or training that we, that we establish. So it can look like so many different things from participation, um, from you know, your HR and recruiting to your content. Um, the, the, the opportunities are endless when it comes to that. And one of the most important ones that I, I find um, is to make sure that you're implementing and incorporating, you know, not only the goals, um, but very much the essence of what your committee is about into every aspect. So really considering how are we making sure that we're extending further out into the organization. Um, a, a, another example is I work with our director of people and culture to make sure that I'm supporting her, not only with um, training and resources, but also making sure um, support as it, as you know, from internships to, you know, partnerships that we may have. Um, uh, so it's really important to make sure that you're not keeping what's happening in your committee within your committee, that that is just the, the team that's really gonna help drive that, um, but that the effort and that the values that you guys are presenting within that is, is just that ripple effect that's going to spread through um, every avenue of your organization. And I think another important aspect to, to note is to measure. Um, so obviously you're going to be putting goals together and you want to make sure that you're at least at some point keeping track of those so you know, okay, did I meet those? Um, how can I further build upon this or evolve? And, and so I think that's 
probably one of the most important aspects of, of a committee or any initiative that you may have at an organization is to have that measurement that's going to be able to inform you um, the additional uh, direction you guys will go in um, and the overall keep the keep the committee fresh and evolving all the time and uh, continue to make it a continued process. Like Matt said, it's a journey. So it doesn't just end, okay, whoop, we're done. We have a committee established, we have goals. It's always gonna be changing. So as your organization grows and changes, so shall your culture efforts, and that's including you know, DIB. So I'm gonna um, pass this on to Mike, I mean, I'm sorry, Matt, who's going to um, uh, uh, talk more about the employee life cycle. Yeah, we uh, wanted to, I think something we talk a lot within the the chamber uh, diversity and equity inclusion committee and learned a lot of insights from my fellow committee uh, members is that that culture is not is not just this one time thing it's not just you know you do it once in a while but it it's continuous it's not and it doesn't just happen at onboarding and it doesn't just happen in that oh let's just do an annual check in um, that that continuous aspect is building a culture that has a full employee life, life cycle. Um, and that can extend beyond uh, when you are uh, taking and leaving an organization too, and, and how you curate and make sure that you're engaged with those that are exiting your company as well. So uh, this is some learning and insights that we've garnered from other organizations, things that we implement, and also you know learnings and sharings from uh, members of our committee like LaShondra has been really great in, in calling out some of this in, in some of her work and in some of her organizations. Uh, so wanted to highlight some of these uh, elements and uh, Vicki, if you want to walk us through uh, some of these employee life cycle uh, components and in, in attracting, recruiting, um, onboarding, and career development. Yeah. Um, and so we broke it into you know phases, and and your employee life cycle may look different than um, or have maybe some more different avenues or components to this, but um, really wanting to make sure um, that upon you know attracting and recruiting talent that you're assessing like i mentioned earlier where you're recruiting talent from you know you want to extend past you know these online platforms and that's where partnerships come into play that's where um uh finding those opportunities to to reach more underserved or underrepresented communities so that way you are building this more diverse and inclusive um uh, uh candidate pool um and as also to ensure that you know job descriptions are you know unbiased and you know they use inclusive language. You know one thing that we have at the agency is, and that definitely helps. And I again, this is another great example too of, of a partnership between myself and our director of people and culture is um, wanting to be mindful and respectful of the language that we use. And it's not just obviously that what we have in um, you know job descriptions. But it's also when we do social posts, when we are writing content, um, and even internally when we're writing, you know, uh, items for our internal newsletter, it's like how we want to best address this, you know, because there's also so many, so many um, variations of 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 this inclusive language, and sometimes it, it does take a little bit of a discussion to just go, okay, what what do we want as an organization to um, to stand by. And so one thing that we did is we actually created a, a DIB um, terminology guide. Um, so that way it's helpful not only for everyone who comes in to know that have a common understanding of when speaking about certain groups or um, you know holidays or topics, that this is at least the foundation that we all can be using the same language collectively. Um, and then also I think it's really important to highlight um, your values and your DIB efforts within the attracting and including talent. And I think it's even more important when a candidate, potential candidate asks about it, you're able to inform them as transparently as, as you can and as clearly as you can. Um, and onboarding integration, one thing that I value so much that we do at the agency um, is we, we have a new hire DIB onboarding and uh, it gives 
us the opportunity. You know, we have a separate one that's around culture and our values, but this one is very specific to giving them direct insight of how they can take part of DIB. Um, Cause it's not just being part of the committee. There are so many avenues and so many different um, ways that uh, new hires um, can do that or that uh, individuals at the organization can do that. And so we spend time uh, 15 minutes, 30 minutes to do that. And, you know, the amount of feedback that we've gotten about that, it was like, this is great. Cause like previous organizations, we didn't do anything. So I have no, I have no, um, nothing to benchmark this against. So it's, it's really refreshing. And also I think it sets them up um, to know that they do have a support system, whether it's something they immediately take part in that same week that same month or maybe a year later. So we just like to give them the opportunity and the tools. Um, additionally, a part of that, of that onboarding and integration part is we do a new hire um, survey. So very similar to the annual survey or the you know uh, biannual survey that we do as uh, to assess like what, what direction we're going with DIB. This one is more mild. Um, it's just more getting a sense of like, did they have any previous experience with you know DIB um, in the workplace culture at any organization prior? Um, how do they identify? Like just really to get to know them and know their levels so that we know how to best support them on their onboarding or um, initially as they begin to get integrated into the organization. And then of course we offer, um, you want to think about too of, of career development and advancement. So um, a, one important thing is to make sure that you're offering equitable and inclusive um, training opportunities, that it's not just training for leadership, that it's not just training for, you know, directors or, or who, you know, anyone with, you know, sort of that title, that you're really building um, growth and empowerment um, from any level. Um, and then also, I think it's important too, when you um, ensure all managers and leaders uh, follow and uphold the same standard um, for I mean, th this, you know, specific is to performance reviews, but I think in terms of leadership in general, and really coming back to the like that authentic leadership, when a leader and a manager feels empowered or feels like they have the tools to be able to um, not only lead, but show up as themselves, that definitely is reflective of how their direct reports will connect with them and be comfortable with them, but also how they interact with others as well. I'll add that part of that attracting recruiting and along with career development as well, uh, you mentioned uh, that we work with Elevate Ed, which is a, a chamber initiative, and that that effort is to bring high school students um, through apprenticeships and internships into organizations. And we've been doing that for the last two years. And it's um, really important from a, attracting from a, again, life cycle. These are high school students. So they're, they're not really sure where they want to necessarily direct their careers. It's an opportunity to expose them to um, opportunities within design or copywriting or video production and open up uh, and expose to things that they maybe not have had experience around or um, to be aware of, you know, how, you know, some of our, our business programs work. Um, it gives them those, those paths and opportunities to do that uh, at, a, at an age when they're in high school. And, and from our, our team side, um, to nurture and a mentor, a high school student can be really exciting. It, sometimes at first, sometimes your team is like, well, they don't have experience. I don't know how they're going to uh, help me as an intern, but you, you think of it more as like, this is mentorship. This is um, opening doors for them to maybe help them find the career path they wanna go on. This is uh, bringing them into a work environment and helping them uh, find their path and what they may wanna do in their future through a lot of different programs and initiatives that we have in our organization. So that gives that additional career development in, in a unique way as well in, in mentoring those interns as high school students. So it's a great program too that supports these um, efforts in, in curating an employee life cycle. And then we'll look at here in the next slide, um, two last points uh, in the employee life cycle around retention and engagement and uh, also exiting and, and being an alumni. And we uh, have a lot of inclusive supportive work environment programs in, in the organization. 
Um, we're, we're doing a lot around uh, give back and creating uh, opening ways that if there's a, a project, there's an organization you want to support, there's various um, channels and ways to bring those into the organization. You can bring it to our DEIB team, you can bring it to our, our director of talent, you can bring it to our community giving um, group and recommend it. You also have recognitions within our organization where they can give back. That's not just rewarding the, the individual, but they also, we have programs where um, we also as an organization give them money to go give to a, a charity or a nonprofit of their choice. Uh, and that helps them feel even more excited in, in how they were recognized and tying it back into the community. Um, so those are small things that we do to retain and engage, um, but you can also use the, this as a checklist um, in building your own uh, life cycle for your team members. Lastly, is thinking about that exit interview um, and, and planning for that, getting really specific. We evaluate our exit interviews annually, uh, meaning the, the questions we ask and how we're engaging with, with the team member. Uh, we review those um, not just as... Um, a manager when someone exits uh, and maybe the person over that group, but we evaluate them as a whole senior leadership team and and pu pull out key themes um, and use those to um, improve and, and change, uh, grow, grow new training programs. So you can definitely learn from that feedback as you're given it. Um, don't make those just passive, uh, really engage in how those exit interviews can help you improve and, and grow in your organization. I love alumni engagement. Uh, it's something I'm very committed to. Uh, I, I, I see it as like, you know, sometimes you go to a university, a college, or you're part of a, an organization and you may move on to that organization. And, and sometimes we, we don't, we may stay in contact with like some of our close people within the organization, but I think it's also a cultural responsibility of the organization to reach out to those alumni and make them feel welcome and part of events or make them aware of things we're doing. Um, I think that builds a life, uh, a life cycle within an organization. So think about how you can also bring that to your alumni, people that have uh, maybe invested many years in your organization and moved on. They're still an advocate. They still can be a recruiter for you. They can still be um, a community champion. So um, continue to reach out and, and find out how you can add value and how they can um, bring value to your organization even after they've exited. We thought we'd capture some of this just in a quick summary. And, and as Janelle mentioned, you'll have access to this presentation and hope you can use it to bring in some ideas and uh, share them out further. But as we look at these across culture um, and diversity and then employee cycle, we've, we've identified things that we're doing in our organization and putting it in action. Um, at the top here is our culture statement. So we put this up front in our uh, in our handbook and in our onboarding on the very beginning of, of our culture. And then we use it often in, in our discussions and in all our team meetings. Um, our culture statement is we want all team members to, to belong and to contribute to the culture of our brand with high performance excellence and a growth mindset to fulfill our company purpose of giving to our team, client partners, and community. Uh, so it's the, the belonging and the contribution. The idea there is that we all own culture. It's not just from, from the executive team or from someone that's in um, over culture, but every individual um, has an opportunity to contribute and belong to the culture of our organization. We've identified here ways that we make that happen. Again, this intentional culture statement. Uh, we, we have weekly volunteer time. We do a lot of give back. Uh, we have recognition. recognition recognition tools um, that we use and we, we give access to those at all levels. So um, for anybody's role, you can recognize one another. Um, it doesn't just have to come from a manager. So it has all access for everyone. Um, we have um, a lot of different programs, as you can see here, that, that help really invest in the culture. And then we ask the team frequently what they want from the culture and, and improve upon that. Uh, from a DIB standpoint, uh, one of our core values for well, the first value of our organization is we are diverse and inclusive collaborators, and we build our business around that statement and, and measure performance and, and our success against that statement. Uh, we, as, as Vicki mentioned, do a lot of uh, onboarding up front, those surveys for new hires. We have that active, engaged EIB team. 
Uh, we one thing we we were um, uh, an individual came to our organization and and found that we didn't have inclusive language in some of our handbook. It was just outdated, and um, they asked us to to update that, and we we worked through that. So sometimes. Um, one individual can help you find um, a solution and 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 make it better for everyone. And so it's being willing to listen and uh, take that in and find solutions around that. Uh, we also had an individual came come to me and said, "Hey, I, I noticed that our 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 leave policy isn't really equitable." And they pointed out the reasons why, and we changed it and made it equitable across any type of parental leave um, and for for multiple needs as, as a parental leave. As a paid leave, we made that equitable um, for all individuals and opportunities there. And we do a lot of um, measurement, as Vicki mentioned in our, our DEIB, DEIB um, data points and, and use those to make sure um, not to make it a checklist or not to make it in, in tokenism, but to make it more um, actionable of how we need to improve and grow and change. Um, so it's really important in, in how we track and measure. And one thing that has been really valuable too for us too in, in building this culture of action is we have outside counsel that we, we retain that are a facilitator and they are an advisor to um, our executive team and to Vicky and our, and our talent um, director for training, further engagement on DEB and in how uh, we develop as an organization. We use that outside counsel to guide us. So we aren't, we don't have blind spots. And so we think about from different points of view that we haven't considered. And also if we have concerns or where the concerns are raised, there's an outside voice helping um, advocate and, and balance out maybe a conversation that may be challenging. And uh, lastly, from an employee life cycle piece, uh, just that ongoing training, the onboarding, offboarding practices. Um, there's there's a really great um, list of actions that we take in onboarding, but we do the same for offboarding and making sure that that individual as they're leaving the organization feels heard, supported, and excited to continue to be um, a champion for our organization, the people that work uh, worked alongside them. And uh, mentor, mentee programs, and then that also thinking about life cycle is really getting your team involved in other organizations and, and giving them time to go and find things that they care about, whether it's during work hours or after work hours, networking on their behalf and, and exposing them to that makes them be more committed to your organization, but also keeps you connected if they are to leave and, and partnering with them in other community programs. Uh, so those are just some great takeaways um, from our culture in action. Um, and we've we've evaluated other big organizations um, that, that have these, and we'll send those out in our materials as well, and you can reference those. Um, we, we brought this from a more mid-sized uh, company organization, uh, but have uh, for, for other larger organizations as well that you can use and reference. This is just a quick snap uh, shot of so, some of those things in, in play, um, whether it's, you know, making sure um, we have content that that builds upon these these values and these learnings, um, the things that we do on social, um, some of our give back or partnerships. Um, it's just a kind of a, a quick overview of just the, that, the culture in action. Um, so as we wrap up, I wanted just to revisit this initial slide um, where kind of putting a little bit of of um, those actions in place with what we wanted to hope you have you guys take away from this, you know, so uh, in terms of defining authenticity, we know that it starts with ourselves, we know that it's it's um, made up of, you know, four components that build that authentic leadership um, that will eventually help us build and create that space of, of belonging and psychological safety. You know, in terms of like, you know, bridging um, DIB efforts and to your mission, um, as well as identifying those key building blocks. Um, we know there's a lot of open communication and encouraging that from, you know, this two way street, as well as providing um, opportunities for employees to participate in decision making um, and being as intentional and honest um, in every aspect. Um, and that includes also, you know, being intent, being honest with yourself of maybe there, maybe something is missing. 
um, and coming to evaluate your core values and your full employee life cycle to make sure that that as your company has changed and evolved, that these aspects have done done so too. Um, and then, of course, we we know we want to be transparent in our actions, be patient, um, and uh, encourage participation, but not force it. And then set that roadmap. Um, and again, this this can be adjusted and fixed based on your organizational needs. Um, but having at least a set roadmap of of knowing where you need to start and what you need to do. Um, helps you know that there's going to be room um, for that evaluating, that evolving, and that adjusting. And then, of course, what are those best practices to put into the foundation of your employee life cycle? Overall, it's just ensuring that there's that there's an inclusiveness and support across all areas. So making sure that everything that you're doing across, you know, DIB, across, you know, uh, authentic leadership, that that's finding its way through every every avenue, every aspect of your organization. So that's it from us. Um, I know we are going to um, open it up for for questions. Great, Matt, Vicky, thank you so much. There was so much incredible content in that presentation. So we'll be excited to share that out. Um, this is something that has been a part of Ideas Collide's culture since the onset. It's a, a huge priority for Matt. Um, they were recognized for that many years ago through our impact awards process when they were a much younger company. And it's just something that has grown and evolved as Ideas Collide has grown and evolved. And they've kept that focus. And uh, they've been such a huge mentor in the space of driving a strong company culture. So kudos to you for living that value for, for years. And thank you for sharing all of that great information with us uh, so that we can take it back and, and borrow some of the great things you're doing and, uh, and build that into our companies as well. I, I know Laura Lynn mentioned several committee members are on the call um, that can be a, a part of the um, discussion that we have next, but I saw that uh, LaShondra Sarter also joined, who's a part of our committee, and then Sherry Bond uh, with ADP, who will be joining the committee in the upcoming fiscal year, so wanted to welcome them, them also. Um, a wealth of knowledge here. So want to hear if uh, you as participants have any questions for Matt or for the committee. So feel free to either um, raise, raise your hand with that tool or pop it in the chat box, but I do see one. Um, yeah, that we have I one will, question there, yeah. Yeah, that we can kick us off with. So Matt, if you wanna go ahead and jump into that, that would be great. Yeah. So Michael, who's with uh, Valley of the Sun, uh, sent us a note about uh, building our, our program with a survey and, and how we evaluated that um, and is looking for resources uh, for building surveys. Happy to, to share out um, our survey as an example, but maybe I'd ask our committee, uh, other, I think um, other tools maybe that are out there or references that we may have in the toolkit uh, but I'm happy to share us as a reference um, for some of the questions that we ask. And Vicki, I don't know if you have any other recommendations or a committee member has a recommendation on other survey examples. I'll just jump in. Yeah, I'm I'm even looking at the survey right now. Um, yeah, I'm I'm our um, survey just really quick. I think this was about 20 questions. So a, a little bit on on the heavy side than our normal standard survey, but it really was, um, some of them were multiple choice, some of them were, you know, um, uh, long form answers. So I'm more than happy to share this, this template that um, I created um, to really give you at least an overview of potential questions that you could ask, um, as well as um, I can definitely point out to what, what were the ones that really drove a lot of um, engagement on. Great. Uh, DEI committee members, do any of you have other thoughts you'd like to add to that? We jump to the next question. I can, yeah, we use something, um, um, we use something to assess when we got started and then we have an advisory council that then does ongoing updates, but there are a lot of tools in the, uh, in the chamber's toolkit on what you can do for assessing. So I would recommend starting there as well. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Doris. Looks like Kent has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I, I appreciated the summer slide in particular I thought got to up there next year. And uh, the question that I had on the summer slide in particular is, uh, when you're talking about um, uh, encouraging participation, um, uh, the summary bullet point you have is encourage participation, but don't force it. Um, um, do you have any good practical examples on how to do that? How do you encourage participation without forcing it? I mean, I think one of the most important things that we've done and I've seen is there is a sense of giving a sense of comfort around participation and, and you have to meet people where they are. So we often talk about um, identify where you are on this journey. And, 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 and that's part of that self-awareness that we put at the very beginning and say, hey, I'm 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 over here and I'm just I'm just exposing myself to like just wanting to be open and and inclusive versus I'm you know I'm I'm a hardcore advocate. There there are others that are like, hey, I don't like this to be forced on me at all. And we allow them to, to voice that and we make them feel comfortable in that. Um, that's also part of why we have our outside counsel. Um, she's really good about um making sure that this is about representing all voices and and allowing all voices to be heard as long as they're in a respectful and we maintain i think often we talk about kindness respect and and being willing to be vulnerable and and not make this uh, about shame or about and so we we set that stage often and frequently we say that a lot we say it in our training um, we say, and the usage of what we, when we send out communications, we're, we're very mindful of there are individuals that don't like this to be forced. And, and we've talked as a committee that there is pushback on that, right? And, and examples of, of where it can feel too, um, as, as Vicki said, you know, sometimes we take a light, lighter approach and sometimes like a more uh, forceful approach in, in content. Um, and, but we always make people feel like there there are options and where they want to be on that journey, because um, we 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 believe it's about this is about learning and sharing. So we're we're always constantly bringing it from a learning. Um, one of our big culture uh, aspects is that we believe in a growth mindset. We say that in our culture statement. So growth mindset uh, is not about being fixed in your mind but being allowing to be open and, and take it from multiple points of view. And so those are things we often talk about in, in any type of conversation and that's really ingrained in our culture. So those are how we, we are consistently trying to set that stage. And then it's that vulnerability too of, hey, if you are not comfortable, if you do feel it is forced, we are also open to hearing that and, and bringing those conversations, maybe they're more one-on-one -on -one conversations Maybe there are conversations that Vicki has with our director of, of talent. Um, so people do feel um, that they they have their voice as well in, in how it's being delivered. So those are some examples um, from our organization. Uh, open it up to other committee members. Or Vicki, any experience with that as well? Yeah, I do want to add in, I, you know, I had mentioned earlier that it's really important to have like that leadership advocate, but I think that speaks just as well for, um, for having those advocates within the individuals who are probably more comfortable. Um, uh, Cause it's like we said, it's not just one person's mission and focus. So I think when you begin to build um, sort of that dynamic with others who probably are on the same page as you, who are more comfortable, who are like, yes, ready to dive in, um, that they can then also be a support for someone else um, and help, um, you know, probably give them some insight or some, some direction on the side where they're probably, I, I, one example though, is we had someone um, who wanted to attend an event, but they were like, I have absolutely nothing to, in their opinion, didn't have anything to add. Um, and this was shared with me by one of my, my subcommittees. And 
I was said, I was like, well, I was like, well, I, I don't want to approach them because they didn't come to me directly. I was like, but me, like, just encourage them, ask them if they just want to sit with you or they just want to sit on a call. They don't have to say anything. I won't direct a question to them, but it's just kind of um, sort of setting the stage and the expectations that just because you join an event or you join um, listening into a, one of the committee calls doesn't mean that we're going to put you right on the spot, that really that that these are also opportunities just to listen in, that these are also opportunities just to be able to be a fly in the wall um, and take in what you can, that participation, even when you're in one of these dynamics, um, is not something that we're going to force on them. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's great. Thank you. Um, another question that had popped up in the chat, and we will um, certainly send out a copy of the presentation to everybody, um, but was about some additional DEI trainings. The chamber obviously hosts these quarterly ones, but um, to Matt, Vicki, or the, the committee and group, if you have any suggestions of other organizations that, that host similar trainings um, that might be of value to people looking to grow in this space, we'd be very open to recommendations. I always love to recommend, I think Angela's still on the call. Angela's um, group puts out the Ideas newsletter, which um, is a great newsletter on various topics and resources. Um, so Angela, I don't know if you're there, if you want to give a shout out to that, but it's something I subscribe to and she recently posted it to LinkedIn. Um, it was recently recognized um, by an organization as an award winning um, content piece for DEI. So i um, definitely looked that up from the Alliance of Arizona Nonprofits. Yes, I am putting the link to that in the chat. Um, and we post any of our trainings that we're doing that are um, DEI related in there, as well as any trainings with our partner organizations that are from across the country. Thank you so much. Um, and if you didn't see it, Doris, who's on our committee, uh, drop this into the chat, and I think it's really great, but um, saying, whoops, I uh, lost my chat here about their common statement that they use um, in their organization in all events that says, uh, we value input and in all perspectives, but that we expect respectful and civil conversations. And I think that's, that's something that's really key and really important to set that stage. So Doris, thank you for sharing that language. That's really helpful. Um, and then there are some Oh, please go ahead, Doris. You want to also add that we do offer also free webinars monthly that we offer to all of the community. So a lot of our students and faculty and staff attend them, but they're open and we usually have guest speakers from across different organizations. So if you wanted to look into that, I believe there's recordings from prior sessions at that link as well. Um, and if you have any access, feel free to reach out to me. That's great. Thank you. Other questions from the group? Well, I'd love some perspective on just things that, um, that you've seen, Matt, Vicki, or from the committee members, um, but things have changed so much over the past few years in terms of the workplace and um, the way that we do work with the remote work, flexible hours, um, unlimited PTO, different things like that. What are some of the trends that you're seeing and, and how are you seeing them affect the workplace culture? Because obviously we're not always all together anymore. It looks very, very different than it did just a few years ago. So. I mean, from my my perspective, one of the one of the, and I don't like to call it a trend per se, but something that's very much on radar. And I think it's on radar for every organization is mental health and wellness. Um, I think the 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 importance there, and I think the important thing to note is to make that a safe environment to talk about in your organization. And some things we've done in our organization is we give. Um, we we say just take a mental take a mental wellness day. You don't have to be like coughing with a cold to be feeling like I need to take time off just for my own mental wellness. And we use that language, so we are 
allowing it to be more common and, and not feel like it's, again, a shaming or um, a pointing out of, of someone and making it more inclusive in, in that language and usage. We also have added um, to our, our time off, we've given what we call renewal days. So they're extra holidays. So we now uh, give an extra holiday at the beginning. Um, so they're longer weekends. So on the Memorial Day holiday, we actually now give the Friday before Memorial Day off for everybody. Um, and we call it a wellness day uh, for that uh, intent of people just to go renew and reju rejuvenate and use more time, like a block of time off. Um, we found that people come back more energized, more invested in work and, and in time investment. So we do that both on the Memorial Day holiday weekend and the, the Labor Day weekend um, to give a larger block of time for people just to be off and disconnected. Um, so that's definitely something that I would say is a trend. Another trend uh, to be very aware of in culture and, and, and working is uh, this ability to disconnect. So we are so virtually connected all the time that that fatigue of always being on a Zoom or always attached to your computer, even when it's in your home. So we do try and find intentional ways to break that up or intentional, again, uh, disconnects, times where we're just like, hey, we need to be disconnected. Uh, Vicki mentioned little things that we do too to, to build that. Like we've done, uh, move, we have we have team members across the country and in different countries uh, that, that work for us. And so we do movies where everybody can um, join in and watch a movie together. We do it over a lunch break um, and, and just let people connect in, in a unique way uh, from, from a different point of view of, of just enjoying time together. Like, uh, we haven't, you don't have that as much in that that uh, virtual world. So we're trying to find those virtual intentions um, to, to connect and also be disconnected. I think I'm one sorry. of the things that, oh, I'm sorry, Janelle. No, please go ahead, Janine. I think one of the things that, that I found really interesting um, within our company, some of our senior leaders have a tagline at the bottom of their email um, that says, you know, I'm working right now, but I honor your time off to Matt's point of getting away from the computer. Please do not feel the need to answer this until you start working again, right? Because there's, there's a little pressure when people with very short titles uh, ping you throughout the day. Lots of you, you want to get back to them really quickly. So I think that's one of the ways that our culture is starting to change too. And I think that I think that's a great thing for people to adapt and make that more normal. I've seen that quite a bit too, Janine. I think that's a really good, good point. And that sometimes that urgency to respond is pressure we put on our ourselves or make an assumption that may not be the case. Uh, just because somebody's working a little bit later, we don't know what happened in their day and you know that they may just have ne needed to get caught up, but not expecting you to respond. And um, that that mental wellness piece um, is is so key right now. And the chamber has a lot of great members within that space. So if you need some additional resources when it comes to that, we're happy to help direct you as well. Um, other Hi. questions? Oh, please, Nikki, go ahead. I, yeah, sure. I don't have a question. I'm rel relatively new to the Phoenix area, but um, it is funny. I, I had a personal experience where I allowed my team to do 360s on me. And they shared that, oh, it was wonderful. I felt so validated. But the one thing I got dinged on is when you send us emails at two or three o'clock in the morning, we feel compelled to act. And really it was just because I happen to be awake and I'm sending them. So I had to learn to actually send them, but send them and schedule the time that they were sent at. I didn't realize I was causing stress in their mental space. And then um, the, and I, ha I have an answer for that question. I was on a call yesterday with about a hundred people nationally. And a lot of them were sharing that they're working remotely, but they're also dealing with some mental health stresses at home, like parents slowly dying, you know, teen acting up and there's nobody to talk to. And uh, so there were no mental health breaks. So for that person, I think it's Anton who asked, how can we do best practice to foster connection? So um, during COVID, I was primarily, well, everybody was, but um, for two years, basically, I was virtual. I lived in Atlanta. So I think the CDC had us 
um, in seclusion for longer than anywhere else in the country. But um, we did virtual happy hours. We did virtual coffee clutches where we didn't talk anything about work. We did scavenger hunts um, virtually that in involved the whole family. So, um, you know, it was just being intentional about not doing work related things, but bu building relationships because we knew everybody was home with family. So building relationship, not just your team member, but involving their family in it. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing, Nikki. Any other thoughts or comments on this topic, either from the committee or from any of you within your organizations? Doris, I think I saw you go off mute. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I had a similar experience as Nikki, and even though the statement was I didn't expect you to respond, they still felt that pressure, and so not sending is usually the best option and scheduling them instead. And then as far as virtual and creating um, environments where people belong and feel like part of a team, we had to really pivot because we're now mostly virtual, except for those that have on-campus responsibilities when students are there, um, is really um, talking through with leaders on how do you create an environment of intentionally reaching out and people being seen? Because if they're only in meetings, either you're not having the hallway chat or you're not having the lunchroom conversations, you're not having in between meeting um, informal conversations, those all kind of go away, what we call the water cooler conversations. And people feel seen in those informal conversations about work that's being done. Hey, great job. Thank you for that feedback. So we had to find ways to really be intentional about doing that in new ways. So we got tools in part of our HR system where you can send out recognition and send to tag people so others can see it as well. So that gave us an opportunity to see people more informally that you wouldn't do in person. We also created community events for those that were local. We would do like movie nights, drive in in our parking lots. We would do different like bingo nights where people can come in and those that aren't um, local, we would then do a virtual um, uh, similar events so that they felt included. So we have like bring your kids to work day that's virtually now and we have different events um, winter fest instead of a holiday party so that we're trying to acknowledge people are in different places when it comes to that and that seems to have worked because we monitor that on our surveys to say hey what is your feeling of belonging and inclusion so there are intentional questions we ask on our engagement surveys every six months to ensure that we're doing a good job. Thank you. And Janine, do you, it looks like you dropped some comments in the chat that were in that same vein. Would you like to share a little bit? Yeah, um, I have teams in different buildings. So um, once a quarter, we set up a meeting and it's nothing but fun. We send, you know, food or Uber Eats um, to each of the buildings. And then there's an online version of Family Feud and Jeopardy. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can go out and create content. And we just kind of rotate through and whoever ends up with the most points at the end, Family Feud's really easy, right? Because it's all based out of 100 points every time. So if you answer a question, you get the points. And then we keep moving through the teams. And my team just loves it. Like they, they continue to ask. I'm running out of creative ideas. We've done it for about three years now. We started during COVID. So, um, but it's a fun way for everybody to engage and kind of, you know, step away from the workday and get uh, reconnected because they don't see each other all the time. Thank you. That's great. And if anyone has ideas for Janine, um, <laughs> as she's running out of them, send them her way. Well, we are fast approaching our time here today. So um, I want to thank all of you for participating. Again, we'll send out materials and follow up after this um, really great discussion today. And hopefully you got some great takeaways. I, I know that I did and some things for us to um, look at doing internally here. Huge thank you to Matt and Vicki for your time and your expertise and such a great program and presentation. Um, our toolkit, Ashley had dropped it in the chat earlier, but um, online at phoenixchamber.com slash diversity. So take a look at our resources. And then if we can help connect you um, with others, let us know how we can best support you as you continue your work in this space. And uh, we will be back in a couple of months for our next quarterly forum. So keep an eye out for that. But um, wishing you all a wonderful day and we hope to see you soon. Thanks so much.